Hello and welcome to Chicago's Union Station. Today we're heading to New York City, but this time we're taking the scenic route. Amtrak's Cardinal will be our ride for the next 28 hours, taking us over 1,100 miles through the Appalachian Mountains and up the Northeast Corridor. We've got quite the ride ahead of us, so let's get started. Our adventure begins as many do here in the Midwest at Chicago's beautiful Union Station. Opened in 1925, Union Station is the fifth busiest rail station in the United States, serving over 2.3 million passengers in 2022. The station is also Amtrak's fourth busiest across the network and the busiest Amtrak station outside of the Northeast Corridor. It is unfortunately a very cold and rainy Midwest winter day, so I'm quick to head back into the warmth of Union Station. Making our way into the west side of the station brings us into the Great Hall. Located at the center of the station head house, the Great Hall spans an enormous 20,972 square feet with a 219-foot long barrel vaulted skylight 115 feet above the waiting room floor. The hall is decked out in holiday decor. Wreaths, ornaments, and bows dot the walls while light Christmas tunes echo throughout the station. The centerpiece of it all is the absolutely massive Christmas tree. The 40-foot tall tree is adorned with thousands of lights and hundreds of railway-themed ornaments. The ornaments include the Coast Daylight, Missouri Pacific, Western Pacific, Rock Island, Rio Grande, Pennsylvania Railroad, Illinois Central, and of course Amtrak, among others. While the main hall is open to all passengers, Amtrak's Metropolitan Lounge is the best place to wait ahead of departure. The lounge is located in the main passageway just off the Great Hall. Access to the lounge is complimentary to all sleeper and business class passengers and to Amtrak Select Plus and Select Executive Rewards members. Complimentary snacks are laid out at the bar just beyond the entrance. The selection today includes various chips, granola bars, sweets, and popcorn. Non-alcoholic beverages are also complimentary and include sodas, water, juice, hot coffee, and tea. Although it isn't super flashy, Chicago's Metropolitan Lounge offers some decent amenities, including a business center, luggage storage, and showers. Of course, there's plenty of comfortable seating, too. I always find that the upstairs portion of the lounge is the best place to wait. Fewer people choose to ascend the stairs, which leads to a quieter, more relaxing environment. Boarding for the Cardinal is called at 523, or about 30 minutes before departure. Waiting for us on track 28 is Amtrak's Cardinal. On the tracks beside us are two of Amtrak Midwest inner city trains, made up of a mishmash of Amfleet Ones, Horizons, and the new Venture cars. There are two sleepers on today's train, both of which are the new Viewliner 2s. The forward sleeper is a standard car, but the sleeper we'll be staying in, car 5009, is a combination sleeper baggage car. Ascending the steps, we once again enter the world of Amtrak's new sleepers, that feeling of first class washing over us as we climb aboard. We'll be staying in room 3, the second room on the left, and our home for the next 27 and a half hours. As we get situated, Amtrak's Capital Limited backs in ahead of its 6.40 p.m. departure. Despite the Cardinal leaving almost an hour ahead of it, the Capital Limited will arrive in DC a full 5 hours and 45 minutes before the Cardinal. It may be faster, but it's not nearly as scenic as the Cardinal, a fact we'll see almost all day tomorrow. While we wait for boarding to conclude, let's take a quick look at our route over to NYC. The Cardinal begins by heading south out of Chicago, quickly leaving Illinois for Indiana. Indianapolis and Cincinnati come in the dead of night, sunrise meeting our train in Huntington, West Virginia. It's all Appalachians on day two, our train twisting and turning through the New River Gorge. Once out of the mountains, it's smooth sailing to Charlottesville and Washington, D.C., where our train switches over from diesel to electric. The Cardinal then transforms into a high-speed hotel, our top speed now up to 125 as we head up the Northeast Corridor to New York City, pulling into Penn Station at the end of the line. We'll cover a total of 1,146 miles on our ride over the next two days, with a travel time of 27 hours and 45 minutes. Departure from Chicago is right on time, our train rolling out of Union Station exactly at 5.55 p.m. The sun has long since set over the Midwest by the time we leave Chicago, the lights of the Windy City illuminating the horizon as we begin our ride east. To see us off today is rail fan and fan of the channel Miles Jajic, who stood out in the rain to get this unbelievable shot of our train and the Chicago skyline.
absolutely massive shout out and thank you to Miles for the spot and footage. He was so courteous as to catch both the Cardinal and the Southwest Chief earlier in the day, so we'll be seeing some more amazing footage from him in a future video. Thank you again Miles for the footage and make sure to check him out at the link below. Our first meal on the Cardinal is dinner, served about 30 minutes after leaving Chicago. The three routes connecting Chicago to the East Coast, the Cardinal, Lakeshore Limited, and Capital Limited all currently serve Amtrak's flexible dining menu. This means there's no way to escape the prepackaged meals en route to the Northeast. The Cardinal also lacks a dining car, which means we'll be dining in our room throughout the duration of our journey. Amtrak's flexible dining menu offers five options for lunch and dinner, all of which come with a side salad, a roll, and either a brownie or butter cake for dessert. For our first dinner on board, I went with the beef burgundy, which quickly comes delivered by our car attendant. Disassembling the package, we find two boxes, one of which contains our main course while the other holds the sides and drink. Defoiling our food reveals a very standard Amtrak meal. Starting with the sides, the salad is fine. The lettuce has that slight rubbery texture of over-refrigeration, but I don't mind it too much. The roll was good though, and came pre-warmed with two units of butter. Our drink for tonight is a can of Coke, spiked with a little something extra. One alcoholic beverage is complimentary for sleeper passengers at dinner, and I always take full advantage. Our main course, the beef burgundy, comes served in a red wine sauce with various veggies and mashed potatoes. Although it doesn't look the part, the stew tastes great. The sauce is savory but lightly sweet, and the beef is well seasoned. Some bits of meat are a little tough, but most are tender and flavorful. The mashed potatoes pair wonderfully with the beef, especially when you get a spoonful of both mash and sauce. The veggies are all well cooked, but feel like a bit of an afterthought compared to the rest of the dish. Dessert for tonight is a chocolate chunk brownie, and of course it's delicious. I'd have to give dinner a 6 out of 10. While it's not traditional dining quality, the beef burgundy is much better than I expected, and most importantly, it's very filling. Illinois is long gone by the time we wrap up dinner. We'll be in Indiana for a little under 7 hours, 100% of which will be in darkness. The Cardinal makes quick work of Lafayette and Crawfordsville, the radiant lights of Indianapolis piercing through the mist as we approach the station. Just prior to reaching the station, we pass by the impressive 63,000-seat Lucas Oil Stadium, proudly serving as the home of the Indianapolis Colts. Indianapolis is the first smoke or fresh air break on the Cardinal, the stop coming at around 11.49 p.m. Our stop here is a little longer than most other fresh air stops, the reason for which can be found at the front of our train. As some of you may have noticed in Miles' departure footage, our train has two additional locomotives, a baggage car, and a Superliner diner at the front. These cars and locomotives are destined for Amtrak's Beech Grove shop, which is about six miles southeast of the station. Train now split, the engineer climbs aboard lead P42 number 167, flips on the headlights, and pulls away from the Cardinal. Quick look at our V-Liner 2 bag dorm, and it's back on board ahead of our 12.15 departure. A refreshing shower is the perfect way to wrap up the day, and at the end of the coach we find just that. The Liner 2 showers boast a completely open design, the room reaching from floor to ceiling. The spacious dry side features a large seat and a well-appointed vanity. Fresh towels are found on the seat and towel rack adjacent to the mirror. An assortment of washcloths and toiletries are laid out on the counter, though the latter comprises only of bars of soap and six bottles of conditioner. Less than ideal for getting clean, but it'll have to do. The shower stall is separated by a frosted glass door, adorned with a stylized P-42 and the skyline of DC. 
The spacious shower stall also extends the full height of the car. However, the shower head is still positioned just below my head, which is annoying to work with, but not unreasonable. The temperature controls are easy to adjust and the water pressure is decent for a train. For a quick cleanup at the end of the day, it's quite nice, but the lack of shampoo and body wash only gets you so far. Returning to our roomette, the seats have been converted into our bed for the night. The bottom bunk is about 6.5 feet long, or 1.98 meters, and stretches the entire length of the roomette. Climbing under the covers, I have about an inch between myself and either wall. Unfortunately, because the bottom bunk is from wall to wall, my head sits directly under the forward headrest, which can lead to some less than pleasant mornings if you sit up too quickly. For me though, it's perfectly comfortable. And with that, it's lights out on day one. The sun hasn't even broken the horizon when we awake on day two. It's about 7 a.m. Eastern Time, and not five minutes after waking up, we pull to a stop in Huntington, West Virginia, 14 minutes ahead of schedule. The cool air hits us as we step down off the train, Huntington our first of four smoke stops on day two. The Cardinal operates the shortest single-level consist of any Amtrak long-distance service. With just two Amfleet coaches, a cafe car, and one and a half sleepers, the maximum capacity of the Cardinal at any given point is only 162 passengers. To add to the Cardinal's low capacity, the train only runs three times per week. Train 50 runs Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday heading east, while westbound Train 51 runs Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Up front, P42DC number 5 takes charge of Train 50. Much like her brethren, Locomotive 5 bears the battle scars of two decades of heavy use. A well-deserved retirement awaits the P42s, Locomotive slated to be swapped by the new ALC42s later in 2024. Behind Locomotive 5 are the two aforementioned coach cars. Designated Amfleet 2s, these coaches are the long-distance version of the inner-city Amfleet 1s. Behind those are the cafe car, and then there's the sleepers. Two Viewliner 2 coaches make up the sleeping segment of the Cardinal, with a total of 16 roomettes, two bedrooms, and a single accessible bedroom. And here's our room, but from outside. As we wait in the cool West Virginia morning, our sleeper attendant takes our breakfast order. I opted for the buttermilk pancakes and a cup of coffee to start my day. With departure time fast approaching, we ascend the steps for the real start of day two. Our attendant is quick to bring breakfast, our meal arriving just as we depart Huntington. The pancakes are light and sweet and genuinely tasty. The pork sausage is fine. The reheating process only got them just past room temperature and they're a little chewier than desirable, but it's fine for a quick meal. As far as breakfasts go, it's a 4 out of 10, a minor step up from the last time we had the Flex Pancakes, but in retrospect, I rated them too high to begin with. While Amtrak's flexible breakfast may not have been great, a much better alternative is today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is cereal reinvented. It's the same great taste you remember from your childhood, but enhanced with grown-up ingredients. Who knew that wholesome ingredients could be so tasty? Magic Spoon cereals are high-protein, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and naturally flavored. Magic Spoon's variety packs come with four delicious flavors, frosted, fruity, peanut butter, and my personal favorite, cocoa. With zero sugar, 14 grams of protein and 5 grams of net carbs in each serving, Magic Spoon is a great way to start the day. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code LONESTARTRIP at checkout for $5 off any order, or go to magicspoon.com slash LONESTARTRIP. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on screen and use code LONESTARTRIP for $5 off your order, or go to magicspoon.com slash Lone Star Trip to save $5 today. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's video. One cup of coffee is great, but two is always better. The self-service station has been cut from the dorm bag car, so we'll have to use the one in the other sleeper. Located between the bedrooms and roomettes, the drink station offers passengers complimentary ice, bottles of water, and hot coffee. A nice bonus on today's train are two bottles of juice, one orange and one cranberry, sitting atop the ice maker. 
Now fully caffeinated, it's time for a tour of our Viewliner 2 bag dorm sleeping car. Viewliner 2 bag dorms include nine roomettes, two bathrooms, and a shower, all conveniently arranged along a central corridor. A departure from the white plastic walls of the Viewliner 1s, the Viewliner 2s feature a welcoming wood veneer, imparting a sense of warmth and coziness to each car. Lights alternate down the corridor, a room number and attendant alert light situated above each doorway. Odd rooms are located on the left, with even on the right. Room 1 is reserved for the car attendant, a small storage area with a trash can found opposite. Rooms 2 through 9 take up the majority of the space, the 8 rooms broken up only by a wall-integrated trash can and storage area. At the end of the corridor are the two bathrooms, shower, and door to the luggage area. The luggage area is smaller than I had anticipated, with racks for around 30 to 40 suitcases. The racks are angled towards the walls to keep the luggage in place, with a folding mechanism to keep them out of the way when not in use. The sleeping accommodations have also been enhanced with the second iteration of Amtrak's Viewliner. Each roomette includes two windows to the center hall, the Amtrak logo atop the smaller of which is a nice touch. Sliding open the door is practically effortless, revealing our 3 foot by 6 foot cabin. Amtrak advertises the roomette as having enough space for two adults, though it can definitely get a bit cramped with two people. The typical blue Amtrak fabric is gone from the Viewliner 2, in its place a textured burgundy and maroon maquette on the seats and armrests. The walls have also received a slight color change, their hue leaning more towards cream than white. Two windows provide scenic views from anywhere in the cabin, the upper allowing the top bunk to see outside while in bed. Stepping inside, we slide the door shut, the lock mechanism not quite cooperating with one hand. Curtains extend to cover the internal windows, ensuring privacy while in transit. In their daytime configuration, roomettes include two very comfortable seats, atop which is each passenger's pillow. The forward seat on today's train is the captain's chair of the roomette. It includes an extra 4-5 to five inches of width and armrests on both sides. The width difference is immediately apparent when the seats are converted to their overnight configuration. Both seats recline using the bar beneath the seat, the bed conversion lever found beside it. Above the captain's chair are a suite of lighting and room controls. Both seats include a bright LED reading light and area light, with the forward seat also including an attendant call button and the PA control. The PA switch is just an on or off with no volume control. On or off is usually all the adjustment I need anyway, so no issues there. Next to the seat, passengers will find two of the four outlets and a fan, operated through a dial for precise control over airflow. Above that are the room light controls and electronic thermostat. The ceiling light stretches the entire length of the cabin, a blue nightlight situated in the center. The electronic thermostat is an awesome addition to these coaches. It allows for actual control over the room temperature, unlike the traditional dials provided in Viewliner 1s or Superliners. And unlike our ride on the Lakeshore Limited a couple months ago, this one is actually working. Coat hooks and hangers are found on the wall beside the thermostat, the buckle keeping my jacket from swinging around while on the move. The room's trash can is situated in the compartment adjacent to the main seat. The rearward facing half of the roomette, while relatively similar, includes the stairs to the upper bunk, the vanity, and most importantly, the sink. In order to fit the stairs and sink, the rearward seat has been trimmed down and the inner armrest removed. The same area and reading light are found above, though the fan has also been cut to save space. Along the windowsill, passengers will find everything in twos. Two cup holders, two armrests, and two AC vents. The armrests are comfortable, but it's interesting to see that the one for the wider seat has clearly been used more than the other. The two cup holders are perfectly sized for a plastic water bottle or a cup of coffee, but do little to hold larger cups in place. Each vent is controlled by a tab extending out from the windowsill, the friction of which is able to hold the vent in any desired position. 
The only thing not in twos along the window is the table, which pulls up and folds out over both seats. It's quite large, with more than enough space to get some work done or dine comfortably with another passenger. The sink, stairs, and vanity are the most interesting features of any Viewliner roomette. Starting up top, the vanity includes a mirror light, mirror, and towel ring, with washcloths and soap on the counter below. Below the counter are the sink, two remaining outlets, the second of two mirror light switches, and the cup dispenser, which unfortunately is empty. Sliding the latch over releases the sink, allowing the basin to fold down onto the upper stair. The basin is quite large, with enough space for both of my hands. Both hot and cold water taps are built into the wall, the drain for the basin located in the well beneath. Unlike the Viewliner 1, Viewliner 2 roomettes do not include an ensuite toilet. Instead, Viewliner 2s offer two communal restrooms at the end of each car for roomette passengers. The removal decision was met with mixed praise. I personally appreciate the removal of the in-room toilet, as sleeping next to one is not pleasant, though I know that other passengers have advocated in favor of the ensuite option. The area where the toilet would be located has been repurposed for storage, offering ample space for large backpacks or smaller suitcases. The space between the stairs can also serve as storage for medium-sized personal belongings. Although the two seats are great for daytime cruising, a second passenger needs a place to sleep overnight. Up above the seating area, we find the answer, the second bunk. Twisting the handle releases the bed, which slides down and locks into place. In its lowered position, the top bunk sits just below the upper window, the bed frame including a similar cutout to the width difference in the seats below. The bed is actually a bed and not just a mattress topper, with proper sheets and a blanket. An air vent, reading light, and attendant call button are all found near the head of the bed. Smaller personal belongings can be stored in the mesh pocket or hung from the coat hooks on the wall. While we're up here, we get a great look at the massive storage area. The luggage hold overhangs the central hallway and is easily large enough for my standard carry-on bag with plenty of room to spare. Of course, if you're traveling with more or larger baggage, then there's always the option to check your bags to your final destination. The roomette, while compact, is an excellent choice for solo travelers or duos seeking a more budget-friendly option. The Viewliner 2 enhances this already outstanding choice by incorporating modern features and amenities, solidifying its position as one of the most pleasant travel experiences available in the eastern United States. If you're enjoying our ride on Amtrak's Cardinal, why not hit that subscribe button? It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then check out the channel's Patreon or become a channel member. If you too want your name in the video or just want to support the channel in more ways than one, then head on over to the links in the description below. Through most of West Virginia, the tracks are at the mercy of Mother Nature and her waterways. It starts with the Kanawha River, which soon transitions to the New River as we head east. The first bit of these waterway views are on the opposite side as our room, so the vestibule between cars is where I ended up enjoying the views. Our passing of the Hawks Nest Dam means we've officially entered the New River Gorge National Park. We cross over to the north bank via the CNO's New River Bridge, the pretty views now return to the side of our roomette. A tributary to the Kanawha River, the New River flows 320 miles through North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. 
The waters have since carved this unbelievable gorge through the Appalachian Mountains, the peaks of which stretch high above the railway. The New River Gorge Bridge is the next major landmark visible from the Cardinal. Standing at an impressive 876 feet tall, the bridge carries US Highway 19 3,030 feet over the New River. That's 276 meters tall and 923 and a half meters long for metric users. When it was constructed in 1974, its 1,700 foot or 518 meter long support structure was the world's longest single arch bridge, a title which it held for 26 years. The New River begins to pick up some impressive rapids the farther east we get. Whitewater rafting is a welcome tourist attraction along the New River. The upper river features easygoing up to Class 3 rapids, while the lower portion includes the biggest of the big, with rapids ranging from Class 3 to Class 5. As pretty as the New River Gorge is supposed to be, the winter weather and barren trees means it's pretty much nothing but brown and gray. A splash of yellow comes as we pull into Thurmond, West Virginia. Thurmond, much like many of the stations in rural West Virginia, is one of Amtrak's least used stations. In 2022, Thurmond serves just 382 passengers, or a little over one a day. What's funny is that despite serving 382 passengers per year, Thurmond only has a total population of five residents. It's also the smallest town in the state of West Virginia. In the early 1900s, Thurmond prospered off of the coal mining in the New River Gorge, its population peaking around 460 people in the 1930s. Outside our window, the beautiful views of the New River continue, our train winding away through the mountains. The tracks leave the New River to ascend into the mountains, the distant peaks obscured in the low-hanging clouds. On its ascent, the Cardinal crosses into Virginia, state number 6 of 10. By the time the tracks level off again, it's time for the Cardinal to make another smoke stop, the first of three in Virginia. Clifton Forge is where we find ourselves, the town of only 3,555 people, a quiet place to step out and stretch our legs. Clifton Forge isn't normally a fresh air break, but with a few extra minutes to burn, the crew allows us to spend some time outside. Ah, it's all right. Climbing back aboard, it's time for lunch. As with our two previous meals, lunch comes delivered to our room. Inside the bag, we find our main, a side salad, roll, and butter cake for dessert. For the main course, I went with the chicken parmesan, which comes with breaded chicken, linguine, broccoli, and a helping of marinara sauce and parmesan cheese. 
it's fine for a reheated meal. The chicken is a little dry and tough in parts, but the flavor is good. The linguine has unfortunately gone hard in spots and the sauce dehydrated a bit, both byproducts of the reheating process. The side salad and roll are what you'd expect, and the butter cake is a delicious way to wrap up the meal. Despite my mild praise, I'd have to say this is a 4.5 out of 10. It's not great for a sleeper meal, but it definitely could have been worse. As mentioned in our room tour, V2 roomettes do not feature ensuite toilets. Instead, two communal facilities can be found at the end of each coach. Each bathroom is very clean and spacious. The sink works well with both hot and cold taps, with a bottle of soap and towels found nearby. Beside the sink is a cup dispenser and two 120 volt outlets. The layout of the bathroom also helps this facility stand out from the usual Amtrak bathrooms. The toilet is angled towards the far corner of the room, which provides significantly more space compared to the typical arrangement. On approach to Stanton, Virginia, the Cardinal glides past the waiting cars of the Virginia Scenic Railroad. Maybe someday we'll be back to ride on them, but for us and the Cardinal, they're just another passing sight. Stanton isn't normally a fresh air break, but we're about 20 minutes ahead of schedule today, which is plenty of time to get out and have a look around. Stanton Station has an impressive curve, our locomotive and lead cars well out of sight at the front of the platform. The rain continues to fall as we enjoy our time outside, admiring the sleek sides of the Viewliner 2s. Manufactured by Spanish company CAF, Viewliner 2s entered service in 2015, beginning with the baggage cars and ending with the sleepers. Amtrak ordered a total of 55 baggage cars, 25 diners, 25 sleepers, and 25 bag dorms. The order was later adjusted to 10 bag dorms and 70 baggage cars. Ascending the stairs to the lead sleeper, we can take a quick look at the cafe car on the Cardinal. Amtrak's Amfleet 2 cafe cars are a little different than their Amfleet 1s. The luggage racks have been removed from above the seats, and each half of the car includes a couple of tables for dining passengers. Amtrak's cafe cars offer a variety of snacks, drinks, and larger food items for purchase, all at a fairly reasonable price. Tucked away at the end of the car is a phone booth, the space now used as a conductor's office. With everyone back on board, our train sets off once again. Between Stanton and Charlottesville, the fog sets in, our train slowing to let freight traffic pass. This unfortunately means that despite our early running into Stanton, we'll be behind schedule from here on out. The late night in Indy and early morning in Huntington are finally taking their toll on me by this point in the day. With two perfectly good beds right next to me, I took a quick nap to recharge ahead of what will be another late night. By the time I'm back awake, the sun has long since left the sky. Outside, the lights of Culpeper, Virginia shine through the mist. In our time of sleep, we missed the penultimate fresh air stop in Charlottesville, but that's no worry as we'll be stopping in DC in about an hour and 45 minutes. Dinner is the next course of action. For our final meal on board the Cardinal, I went with the chicken enchiladas, which again came with a side salad roll and a brownie. The enchiladas taste great, especially for a prepackaged meal. The Mexican spices of the ranchero sauce are flavorful, and the chicken is well seasoned. The beans and corn are also nice, adding some different flavors beyond the enchiladas themselves. The roasted jalapeno is a nice touch too, bringing some heat and a bit of smoke to the dish. Overall, I was once again pleased by this dish, and I'll give it a 6 out of 10. Definitely not a bad choice given the options. It's fairly slow going into Washington, D.C. Outside, the Washington Metro whizzes past, our train forced to wait for a green signal ahead. After a quick stop in Alexandria, we cross over the Potomac River and into the tunnels of Union Station.
Emerging from the tunnels beneath DC, our train comes to a stop for the fourth and final smoke stop of day two. This is also where the coolest part of the journey happens, the engine swap. DC is the southern terminus for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, the electrified mainline running from here to New York City and up to Boston. Amtrak trains running on the Northeast Corridor are operated by electric motive power. This means we must bid farewell to our P-42 in favor of a Siemens ACS-64. Despite the cold and rainy weather, the crew gets to work uncoupling Locomotive 5 from the Cardinal. While we wait, the train on the adjacent platform pulls away, revealing behind it one of Amtrak's new ALC-42 locomotives. This is my first time seeing an ALC-42 here at Union Station, the locomotives used to haul the Capital Limited and Silver services out of Washington, D.C. Lying in wait on the far tracks are five electric ACS-64s. Now decoupled, Locomotive 5 pulls forward to finalize the disconnect, the engine then pulling clear to make way for our electric locomotive. In the meantime, our train is left without head-end power. This means minimal lighting and, more importantly, no power to the septic system, which in turn means no bathrooms while the change is taking place. With Locomotive 5 now well on its way to the Ivy City Maintenance Facility, two ACS-64s begin backing their way down Track 23. The 615 will be our motive power from here to New York, the lead ACS-64 of this approaching pair to be disconnected after the swap is complete. The 615 stops just shy of the Cardinal, allowing the crew to perform one final check before coupling on. With our train now under electric power, we can climb back aboard and continue our ride to New York City. The rain continues to fall as we pull out of DC, beginning our run on the Northeast Corridor. Reaching the Northeast Corridor comes with the added benefit of increased speeds. From here to New York, we'll be cruising in our hotel room at 125 miles per hour. Although it's difficult to see, we soon reach 125, the occasional streetlights darting past the window the only indication of our speed. The Cardinal makes quick stops in Baltimore, Wilmington, and Philadelphia, each separated by a quick burst of triple-digit speeds. It's all high speed through New Jersey, our train stopping only in Trenton and Newark before crossing the Portal Bridge and dipping into the tunnels below the Hudson River. The lights of Penn Station break the darkness, our train arriving on Platform 6, 28 hours and 39 minutes after departing Chicago. Grabbing our bags, we can head out onto the platforms of New York City. With one final goodbye to our sleeper and locomotive, it's time to bring today's video to a close.
If you made it to the end, I just want to say thank you. Sharing journeys like these are my favorite, so it's always a great feeling when people stick around until the end. Anyways, next week we'll be back in Canada to ride on VRL's Renaissance coaches from Quebec to Montreal. If you're new around here, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. Another huge thank you to my loyal patrons and members. Y'all are amazing, and your incredible generosity is greatly appreciated. If you too want your name in the video, or just want to support the channel in more ways than one, then head on over to the links in the description below. But anyways, that's all I have for today. Thanks for riding with me, and I'll see you in the next one.